Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership, a series that focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guests. Pragmatic, straight shooter, and driven are adjectives that could be used to describe today's speaker. Jaina McCarthy was tapped by President Obama in 2013 to lead the EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. An environmental health and air quality expert, Ms. McCarthy quickly identified some major challenges for the EPA to tackle. Addressing climate change, improving air quality, taking action on toxins and chemical safety, and protecting water, a precious but limited resource. A longtime civil servant and progressive leader, Ms. McCarthy held positions as Assistant Administrator of the U.S. EPA, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, Deputy Secretary of the Massachusetts Office of Commonwealth Development, and Undersecretary for Policy for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. In 25 years of experience, she has advised five Massachusetts governors on environmental affairs. A Boston native, Ms. McCarthy graduated from the University of Massachusetts, Boston with a Bachelor of Arts in Social Anthropology. She later attended Tufts University, earning a Master of Science in Environmental Health Engineering, Planning and Policy. Of her many contributions, Ms. McCarthy considers the cleanup of Boston Harbor a major environmental achievement, so successful she has been known to say that she can no longer afford to live in any Boston waterfront property. <laughs> When she's not protecting the environment, Ms. McCarthy is fascinating, fascinated with cooking shows and is a huge fan of Ina Garten, known as Barefoot Contessa. Ms. McCarthy also has a unique ability to spot infractions in hotel and restaurant kitchens with just a quick passing glance. <laughs> Before I turn this session over to Dr. Howard Cole, Harvey V. Feinberg, Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership here at the school and also at the Harvard Kennedy School, who will conduct our interview today, please join me as we welcome Ms. Gina McCarthy to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Thanks. So, Administrator, welcome. Thank you. It's great, great to be here. Great to see you. So we all know you're a person of many passions and interests, but to start, you have to tell us, how did you get into Barefoot Contessa? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not often that I can actually cook anything and have it come out successful. She's great. Um, you know, cooking actually became a really good distraction for me. I mean, I mean we're in busy jobs. We've worked together for a long time. We both uh, sort of uh, work 24-7, and, and you know, cooking's really fun. And every time I, uh, for the past 11 years or 12 years, I've lived away from home. Um, and so when I get home, I'm going to have a celebration, <laughs> and that's what we do. We eat. We might uh, enjoy other liquid refreshments as well. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's really become fun, and she's, she really is fabulous. Hey, did you know she was an OMB analyst? <laughs> Office of Management and Budget. She may be the only OMB analyst I really care for. I'm not really <laughs> Just kidding, love those economists. <laughs> and uh, many people may not know that right out of school, one of your first jobs was to head public health in your hometown of Canton, yeah, that's right. Massachusetts, a town of about 20,000. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that and how that shaped your view of the world. Well, you know, um, one of the things I was most interested in is community health work uh, because I try to remind people that while EPA is a you know, an environmental agency is essentially a public health prevention agency. That's what I do for a living. And when I started out in school, that's what I wanted to do was community health work. So I was working in community health centers. And my mother got ill, so I, I wanted to come back home. And there was a job in my hometown that was open. Uh, and I didn't have any idea what it was. I'm still not sure. I know what it was supposed to be, but I know how I did it. Um, it was a health officer, and, and in a health officer position, you do everything from, you know, you have a public health nurse that helps with vaccinations and health, health clinics, but you also do restaurant inspections, housing inspections, septic systems. I, I can design a septic system. <laughs> you can make big bucks doing that, I'll tell you. And so you, you learn everything, and it, it became, I was fascinated by it. Uh, that's when I, I first met Suzanne Condon and many of the folks at the DP 
EPH because we had a big cancer scare when there was mm -hmm. some hazardous waste that was found in a, in a woods. And that's when I started getting involved in environmental issues because I began to quickly realize that that uh, it's, it's larger than a single community. There's lots of environmental exposures that you have to worry about, and, and I've begun to focus on that uh, pretty much exclusively. So you've been a public servant for your whole career, 30-plus years. Uh -huh. You've watched Thank you for saying 30-plus. <laughs> <laughs> you've watched and observed many previous EPA administrators. Mm -hmm. Now you're on the inside, and you are that person. It's what frightening, isn't it? <laughs> I think about that every day. What's it like to be the number one person now? What do you, what do you know now, uh, being on the inside, that you never thought about when you were on the outside? I actually, I, I love my job. You, you couldn't have really a better job. Um, it's not that it isn't contentious, it absolutely is. Uh, but I think part of why I like it is because in my history, I've, I've grown in this. You know, I've seen these issues all through government, from the local through the state and, and regional and then beyond. And, and I think I bring a lot to the table. I think I bring an understanding of how to speak clearly to people, let, let, try to focus on priority issues, not the, the deal of the day or what happened in legacy issues uh, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I try to make sure that people in the agency remember what they're doing is, is a really important task. And as much criticism as we get, you have to keep listening to people. You have to keep finding the right solutions, making progress moving forward. And, and I think it's, it's a great place to be, and I'm in a, a tremendous administration, I think, as you know. I have a president who's not saying, why are you doing something? He says, why aren't you? <laughs> if that's not the place where I want to be, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, Clean Power Plan has yeah. been a central theme in your administration. It has. You announced the final rule last August. It got a lot of attention through the December Paris Climate Change Accords. And then just a couple of weeks ago, as we all know, it got um, a stay imposed by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court. So tell us where we are with all that. What, what's going to happen in the future? Well, first of all, people should realize that um, it's alive and well. Uh, the Clean Power Plan exists, and we're going to do okay. Um, it's a really solid rule. Um, we were surprised by the Supreme Court decision. It was disappointing. Uh, but it doesn't mean that really anything on the ground has changed. The rule still exists. It will go through the court process. Frankly, everything that EPA does is, I would argue, it's fairly meaningful. So it ends up being challenged somewhere. And, the, and we expected mm -hmm. the Clean Power Plan to be challenged. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a pretty significant rule. Um, but the good thing is, and I've, I've met with lots of states since the stay, uh, lots of organizations, life is continuing the exact same direction as it was before the stay. You've got, you know, renewables that are, that are competitive and remaining competitive and getting better every day. You've got great energy efficiency programs. You've got states that are continuing to be active. Many of the states, remarkably, within 24 hours of the stay said, doesn't matter to me, I'm still submitting a plan. So we have tremendous momentum out there, and it's not just domestic, but it's international as well. Um, I guess uh, it, it, you, you would expect it to continue anyways because we're already seeing the impacts of climate mm -hmm. and people know it. You know, yep. the few climate deniers that exist are certainly not going to convince the rest of us who, who mm -hmm. see what's happening and are going to do the best we can to protect one another. And that's what climate change action is all about. What, what should all Americans know about the Clean Power Plan? The Clean Power Plan, they should know, is first of all, it's legally solid. It was developed with the most outreach that any rule has ever done, recognizing that it impacts everyone. It's a rule to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the largest sources in the U.S., which are our fossil fuel power plants. But it does it in a way where every state gets to choose their own path moving forward. So some states might, might choose to look at making their fossil fuel facilities more efficient. That will lower some. Some states might look at more renewables being brought in, lower energy demand through energy efficiency. It also has this really cool little leveraging program in it um, called the Clean Energy Incentive Program, which is basically additional federal leverage to target um, activities and interest and investment in, in the poorer communities and environmental justice communities. Mm -hmm. Because while EPA has done great and while the Clean Power Plan can do great, we know that it's always the poor, it's always the minority that continue to feel the brunt 
of the, of the continued exposures in that are going to be the brunt of climate change. They should be the beneficiaries of the action. So it's a great program, lots of flexibility. It will not raise energy prices. It will not shut facilities down. It's all going to be in the hands of, of each of the states to chart their own destiny. And it allows lots of trading in between states. So you can do it on your own, you can do it regionally, you can do it nationally. So there's lots of flexibility and it's going to get done. And it will, it will survive and it's uh, going to continue uh, the momentum moving forward. One of the most extraordinary parts of your job is that you're in an in an inherently controversial field. Mm. Just thinking about your run, you've had that challenge with the Colorado River last, yes. last year turning yellow when mine waste yes. was uh, released accidentally. Yes. We're now facing the Flint water crisis where yes. one of your regional managers had to resign. Yes. This, this is your world, you face it every day. So how, how do you do that both professionally and personally? What, what helps you get through these? Well, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to separate profession from personal. Um, uh, it, 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 because I have a personal commitment. I mean, I work with 15,000 people whose mission is to protect public health and the environment. We feel that personally. But I don't take it personally. You know, I, mm -hmm. I just, if mm -hmm. I did, I'd be cowering in a corner somewhere, and mm -hmm. that's kind of not a great job to have. Mm -hmm. um, I actually thrive on controversy. I, I, if we're not doing something controversial, then, then we're probably going with the flow of what would have happened anyways, and why bother? Why am I away from my home, my family, for all this time, putting in all these hours, if I'm not tackling the tough issues that need to be tackled? And there's always confrontation. There's always differing opinions. I think one of the best educations I had, and this is, uh, you know, no, no, no uh, slight on Tufts, which was great, was UMass Boston when I did social anthropology. That's when I realized that my view isn't the only one. Mm -hmm. That my my sense of what what matters or doesn't isn't isn't you know is my own but isn't necessarily shared by everybody else. I actually think other people have legitimate interests, mm -hmm. and I actually think it's perfectly appropriate to ask whether or not jobs are going to be lost and whether or not it's going to support the economy because that's the way in which you design systems that do it all. So I think when you when you are a public servant, you deserve to to actually serve every part of the public. The ones that want to eat well, the ones that want to keep their families safe, the ones that want to breathe, le live in, in, uh, in a clean community, in a healthy community. And I don't think we need to dissect them. And so I'm not going to take it personally if someone says that I'm going to lose my job, what am I going to do? I think that's a legitimate question and I think it, it deserves to be answered. You've alluded to the importance of communication, crisis communication. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of how oh. you've used and lowered. Good and bad, or just, could I just a Anything you want. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of the Gold King Mine, which was... Mm -hmm. um, the Colorado River. Yeah, it's a Colorado River when there was a whole bunch of, of mines that were upstream, and my folks were actually there beginning to look at how they could prevent a blowout from happening because Colorado and the surrounding communities were worried about a blowout, which means a lot of trapped... Um, uh, mine waste would come out, and it's very heavily laden with, with, um, uh, with metals. And, 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 and part of doing that, they actually created a blowout. Um, now, the, the thing to remember about this is a whole bunch of things that I'll always remember. Uh, the one is that it came the week after the Clean Power Plan which was my one week of vacation. I already couldn't go until Wednesday. I got down there on Wednesday, the Gold King mine accident happened on Thursday or Friday. It was not a good week for me. Uh, so I'm looking at the picture of this beautiful yellow river flowing down saying, oh, I think I might have to go back to Washington. I thought my husband was gonna kill me. But, you know, talk about crisis management, tr trying to explain EPA created the problem. You know how many sites we work on? How many thousands where we do the work that nobody else wants to do because they're afraid or they don't know how? And I get the one that happens. And so I, I think crisis management was you had to be honest about it and say, yes, we did it. We had the best of intentions. We'll look at whether or not we did, did everything we could in terms of due diligence and did we do, make a mistake. And I went down there and I stood up and I said, it's EPA's problem, I'm going to fix it. Oh. And so we're, we're looking at both making sure that we're compensating anybody that was harmed. We're looking at, you know, uh, working on a long-term plan. 
Um, but the good news about Gold King is that, you know, it really was a bright color, but the bright color was because the, the iron was oxidizing. It meant we had actually less problem than how it usually leaks, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty constantly. And so it was only a half a day's release of what generally comes from those mines and goes into those rivers. So I feel good that we'll be able to compensate. Flint, on the other hand, I'm taking a lot more personally. Um, that's a situation where a community uh, had uh, an emergency manager come in and decide to save money by switching to an untreated source of drinking water and they decided they weren't going to treat the drinking water to make sure it wasn't corrosive and wouldn't leach the lead out of the pipes. And EPA didn't find this out until quite late in the game. And we're there now, I'm actually going there a little while later, but, but when you have kids exposed to lead, that's a whole different ball game than worrying about, about iron in, in a river. Um, that's real kids and, and, and real damage that you can't get back. What's going to that be a, I take personally. What's going to be a long-term plan on Flint, do you think? Well, we're going to go down there. The, the EPA's job right now is to take water samples to make sure that, that the kids that shouldn't be drinking the water aren't, mm -hmm. that everybody has filtered water, um, and that we have an army of people there getting information out, getting bottled water out to folks. We're doing all the analysis. Because the analysis, uh, the lab analysis, need, meet the water testing needs to make sure that there's chlorine in the system effectively, that the corrosion control system is now up and functioning and going to be optimized. Then the community wants to look at lead line replacement, which is fine, but lead line replacement is not the only source of lead that people get. Um, and, and so we have to keep working through that. There's lead pipes in a lot of the older homes out there, and that's, that's as big a problem as the lead lines. So you have to keep the corrosivity, uh, in, uh, the, uh, uh, the treatment, the corrosivity treatment up where it's supposed to be no matter what. Um, and we'll have to keep working through those issues. The, uh, the federal government has a large presence there from CDC, ASTDR, all health and human services are there. And they're going to be uh, tracking the kids, mm -hmm. taking a look at what lead levels are in the blood, um, and making sure that they get some additional services moving forward, like Head Start and, and other things. But, you know, the, the sad state of affairs, though, that's a legacy issue that's been around since Julius Caesar and prior to. <laughs> You'd think we still wouldn't be dealing with lead, but we are. But the challenge for EPA also is that we need to make sure our rules never allow this to happen again. Our regional administrator actually resigned on her own because she knew she'd become a lightning rod for whose, whose fault was it instead of let's focus on fixing it, you know, and let's get the job done. And, uh, and the challenge for us is that most of the lead in people's, in kids' blood is not coming from water and lead and water. Anybody know what it's coming from? Lead paint. And lead paint is the source of, of most of it. And that's a challenge that remains today. So there's legacy issues that we have to keep focusing on. But, but Flint, like that community, it's, it's, it's very high poverty rates. Those that are above the poverty level are just barely. Um, it, its water system uh, needs a complete, you know, really complete reinvestment, never mind the lead issue. And that's a situation where I think represents some of the challenges that EPA has to focus is it's not just about national rules and getting good on average. It's about getting into communities, talking to them about why these environmental exposures are important, getting investment in those. And it's uh, one family at a time when you're in a community level. And frankly, that's where we are environmentally. It's not just one national rule at a time. It's getting into communities and getting into environmental justice communities in particular. So another major challenge in your field is that you want the best science possible in any conceivable topic. Mm. But oftentimes, the science is not well formed. And yeah. you have to make a decision. We have some leading environmental scientists in the audience. How can they best help you? And also, how do you make decisions in the situation where there's so much scientific uncertainty? Well, I, you know, there's, there's two different ways of approaching that. There are many, there's much science that it actually is very, is very well defined. M much of it is coming from this great institution. And, and still we have trouble with that because 
people don't understand how science is done, and we have folks on the Hill that would rather dispute certain science mm -hmm. uh, than make decisions on the basis of it. And it's EPA's job to do what the science and the law says. So that's a constant tension. And I think all I need to do is, is mention ozone and particulate matter, and people will get what I'm talking about. Climate change may, may be another one of those, those things. <laughs> But the, the science is certain, and we do act on them. You, yes, you have to explain yourself. Yes, you have to look at, at how you can do it in a way that, that allows a transition for people so that the goal is right. We give people the truth about what a real health standard should look like. But you make steady progress. You don't shut everything down. You keep moving forward. And I think we've done that. We've done a, a great job at doing that, and we'll keep telling the truth about what the goal is and, and plugging away. There are other challenges that we have, though, in the water area in particular, which is these emerging chemicals, which present very significant difficulties for us because we have regulated contaminants and we have unregulated contaminants. And every year we're only allowed to add so many of those to the list, and it takes five, six years to actually thoroughly look at them from a science perspective to know what that level ought to be, and then it takes a number more years to even add one to a list of what's regulated. That's where the challenge really can be enormous today because we do have emerging chemicals that you're finding. Uh, most of them are, are fairly localized, but, but it doesn't uh, per, um, pr preclude us from needing to do an incredibly thorough job. And we have pretty lousy toxics rule right now. Uh, the Toxic Substances Control Act is not where it needs to be. Thankfully, Congress on both sides seem interested in looking at it. We hope so because with all the unregulated chemicals out there that have been in the system for years, they're making their way in. Pharmaceuticals are popping up. Yeah. At what level do you want to see those in there? Probably mm -hmm. zero, but they're there. How do you deal with them? Those are the, the areas where EPA scientists have to do a lot more work, but frankly, it, it takes institutions like this and, and others, and it take, takes connecting the dots between you know, EPA's environmental scientists and epidemiologists and public health experts who can connect those dots for people. So we have a lot of students watching who want to be a future public leader like you. Give me your name. <laughs> I want you. <it. laughs> what, what broad advice would you give them and what skills might be important to do jobs like yeah. yours? I actually really like people who have uh, uh, a variety of skills. I don't think you need to come to EPA with anyone, um, from, from any one direction. Um, people who have worked in communities are always helpful because it means you can talk to people and explain. I think the, the greatest challenge we have is to speak, tr speak truthfully and clearly so people understand the pros and, and cons of different approaches. Um, EPA is, is right now, I am for 11 months, really going to be trying to reach out to the public health community. Um, I think EPA, many people think because the E is in the EPA that we're not pub about public health, but frankly that is what we do for a living. That's what the environment is for us, is how do we, uh, how do we have a clean environment so that we can protect public health. And so folks can, can come in in a variety of different ways. We have, we have everything from, from community communications people to community organizers to epidemiologists, which we need more of, uh, to people who know how to do chemistry and biology. We have economists. I mean, you name it, um, they can make their way into EPA. And frankly, we're looking at EPA as trying to really uh, get more diversity in our ranks, um, which I think connecting with public health advocates can do. Um, I think it can bring more people to the table, larger voices that can, can speak for a variety of communities and allow EPA to be more diverse as well. And I'm looking forward to that day that we're better represented, representative of the people we serve, because we're not there yet. But that's, it's better in the regions than it is in headquarters. Um, Washington's a difficult place to get to know and love, although I've, I know it very well. <laughs> I didn't say I loved it, but I, 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 I <laughs> So we just have a couple minutes left. Any final words of wisdom that you want to share? Anything else that you want to say to the audience? I think the, the, the thing I want to make, uh, I, I think, make known is that, that as I said, EPA is a, a primary prevention uh, opportunity for the United States. I think we've done a, a great job, but we need to continue to make those investments. One of the things that I'm, I'm concerned about the most 
is that uh, there are folks that can stand up and say, I don't like EPA anymore. I think they should be defunded. I think that's a, that's a uncomfortable thing for me to listen to, especially knowing that when it's their family and their communities, they want us there. But we will be there. Uh, EPA is doing well. We have great people there. Uh, we're we're mission-driven. Um, I think we have a lot of work that gets done, to get done. Um, I also want to make a plug that I think action on climate change is about the biggest thing we can do for public health anywhere, and we will do that. So I think I have 11 more months to go under a great leader of this president, and we'll have lots more to say, lots more to do. We're not slowing down. We're running as fast as we possibly can to the challenges, to the priorities, making the tough decisions, because that's what EPA does, and that's what I do for a living, and I love it. <laughs> so, it's Minister, it's so great to see you. What a wonderful conversation. Went by so fast. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to thank the audience, and we want to uh, mention that the next Voices interview will be March 8th when we have uh, Senator Tom Daschle here, the former Senate Majority and Minority Leader. So, please join us for that interview. And thank you very, very much. Round of applause for the Administrator. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.